The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you're having a great weekend. Uh, happy Sunday to everybody. Thanks for joining me here on the second show for this uh, weekend. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be home for a few days. I'll be, uh, I'll be on the road again on Tuesday, but it's, uh, it's good to be in my uh, sleeping in my own bed uh, for, for a little while. Um, and, uh, of course, having the opportunity to do shows. For you guys, so uh, thank you, welcome, and uh, I appreciate it. Particularly, I appreciate all of those of you who are supporters of the Iran Book Show, whether it's on uh, Subscribe Store or on my website. And many of you are still supporters of the show on Patreon. I will encourage you again to move from Patreon, either to SubscribeStore.com or to uh, to YaronBookShow.com/support. Uh, Mauritius says it's snowing. I'm not sure where it's snowing here is, but the weather all over the United States seems to be pretty rotten. In Puerto Rico, it is pretty amazing weather. And, uh, but unfortunately, I go on the road on Tuesday and I get to directly confront all the bad weather that's uh, through the United States. Um, today, I want to talk about the, the variety, the various uh, democratic programs that the Democrats who now have control of the House and who can smell a little blood and, and think maybe they can get the presidency or certainly they think they can probably get the Senate and I think they've got a good chance of getting the Senate in two years. I, and, uh, you know, they can spl- smell blood. So just like the Republicans, when the Republicans were in the opposition, you remember when, they, when uh, Obama was president and Republicans had the House, they passed all these all these bills that supposedly represented the Republican agenda. So Republicans, when they were in the opposition, they passed the repeal of Obamacare. That was so cool, right? They repealed Obamacare. Of course, it went in no way because the Senate didn't do it. And, uh, and uh, uh, Obama would have, would have vetoed it anyway. And, of course, that was the whole point. The whole point was to pass a bill that didn't have any chance of success anyway. Didn't have a chance of being passed anyway. And then... Um, under Paul Ryan, they had a budget that actually slowed the growth of government spending and actually voucherized for a while. There was, the proposal was to voucherize Medicare and it did all kinds of interesting things and quite, quite, uh, quite a good budget. I mean, way too much spending, but relative to what the Republicans usually propose, quite a good. And they passed that because they knew it would go absolutely nowhere. And they, they passed it year after year after year because they knew it would go absolutely no way. And then when they finally got the House and the Senate and the presidency, all those good bills went away. They disappeared because Republicans do not have the moral fortitude to actually pass the ideas that they often run on. And it's going to be interesting to see about Democrats. I think the Democrats are much, um, much more uh, much braver in that sense, much more committed in that sense. I, I don't think they're going to pass some of the wackiest parts of the agenda as proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I, I do think that they will move us far more to the left if they gain the White House and they gain the Senate, far more to the left than Republicans moved us towards economic freedom. Uh, Republicans didn't move us towards economic freedom. They moved us in the opposite direction. And I think what will happen, and that, was, that happened when, when they had the White House, the House under Bush, and that's what hap- has happened when they've had the White House, uh, you know, the Senate and the House under Trump. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, it, Republicans, when they control all, all levers of power, a disaster. Uh, they move us to the left slowly. Democrats, I fear, when they have all the levers of power, will move us to the left fast. Remember that Obama only had the House and Senate with him for two years, and, and during that period is when he managed to pass Obamacare. Imagine if he'd had it for eight years, what they would have passed. And this crop of Democrats are far worse than, uh, than the crop of Democrats under Obama. 
Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about some of the proposals that are, uh, that are out there uh, the Democrats want to do. And I really, what I really want to spend time on is I want to spend time on how they're going to pay for it. Because, of course, that's the one thing the Republicans say when the Democrats propose all these things. How are you going to pay for it? They don't make them all argument against it, which I will make today. They don't make them all argument against all these proposals, but they ask, how are you going to pay for it? And I'm going to tell you how they're going to pay for it, and I'm going to present you with two economic theories that the Democrats, uh, that the Democrats have that they argue will make it possible for them to pay for it. I will try to make a credible case for both, even though both are nonsense. They uh, both... Uh, mainstream economic theories today, or one's, one's a little bit less mainstream than the other one, but, they, but it's gaining mainstream status. And they're real economists with Nobel Prizes who advocate for these things. And uh, for them, the question of how you're going to pay for it is a stupid question from stupid Republicans. So uh, it's not only that Republicans should be making them all argument, it's also that Republicans actually can't answer and can't debate the Democrats on economics because the De Republicans have no, have no um, economic uh, theories, have no economic knowledge to combat what the Democrats have. Somebody's saying, are Republicans better than Dems? I mean, uh, Republicans are marginally better than Dems. They're, they're definitely better than Dems when they're in opposition. So Republicans are very good at shutting down the left's agenda. Uh, when the left, for example, is in the White House. But Republicans, when they have all levers of power, are almost as bad as the Democrats when they have all levers of power. They move us left. They just do it left in terms of economic policy. They do it just more slowly. So, um, you know, there have been these studies, right, done. I'll just, there have been these studies done on the growth of government spending, right? in different compositions of White House versus the House and Senate. And the most, in terms of increased government spending, is when Democrats have the President, the House, and the Senate. But very close behind, just very close behind, in terms of government spending, is when Republicans have all three branches of government, of, of uh, legislature and executive power. So, by the measure of government spending, there's very little difference between the two. Democrats are slightly worse, but only slightly worse. Now, when it comes to divided government, it's interesting. When there's a Democratic president and the Republicans control the House or the Senate, so when there's a Democratic president and Republicans control the House and the Senate, that is the best for government spending. That is the best for government spending. And when the Republicans have the White House and the Democrats have the House and Senate, that's the second best, although that might all change now that we have Trump, where you've got a Republican and Democrats and government spending going through the roof. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's possible that that will become one of the worst scenarios. But the best scenario from purely government spending perspective is a uh, Democratic president and a Republican House and Senate. And this is why, for example, I was not overly worried about uh, Hillary Clinton becoming president because the Republicans had the House and the Senate. And if the Republicans held the House and the Senate, Hillary Clinton couldn't have done anything. I think that's even true of Bernie Sanders. If Bernie Sanders were president, it's, it's even more true of Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders could not have compromised the center. Uh, Bernie Sanders' presidency would have been completely impotent if Republicans had the House and the Senate. So the best combination for government spending, which is a measure of government involvement in the economy, government involvement in our lives, is a Democratic president and a Republican House and Senate. Now, I know that idea freaks many of you out, but that's just what the numbers tell you if you look at the last hundred or so years. That is what it, that's how it works. All right. Um, so where should we start? Well, the number of proposals. Let's start with the one that probably is going to pass the House um, with all Democratic votes. The others are probably going to have to wait. They're just, uh, they're just uh, trial balloons or trying to shift what's called the Overton window, trying to shift what is possible, what people are willing to consider. But we'll talk about those. So the first one is 
uh, expanding Social Security. So instead of so for, uh, one of the one of the great disasters which uh, which Trump has inflicted on the Republican Party, and I know many of you hate the fact that I that I talk negatively about Trump, but these are facts. I encourage you to refute the facts um, if if you think I'm wrong. So one of the, one of the great damages that um, that Trump inflicted on the Republican Party is that all the other candidates running for president on the Republican side all talked at some point, to some extent, as did the Republican leadership in the House and Senate, about reforming entitlements. They all talked about reforming entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Trump took that off the table. Trump said, no, we are going to defend and protect and save entitlements because he sensed what is absolutely true, he sensed that while the Tea Party voters, while many of the Trump voters claim they believe in limited government, they also want the government to take their hands off of their Medicare and off of their Social Security and off of their entitlements. So uh, he understood the voters better than other Republicans. Other Republicans thought, oh no, the voters are fiscally conservative and, and it, the debt is important to them. It turns out, no, not at all, Republican voters want their benefits. They want their middle class benefits just like everybody else wants their benefits. There's no difference. So what Trump has done is taken Social Security reform, proper reform, well, a proper reform would be phasing out, but at least shrinking the role of Social Security, shrinking Social Security spending off the table. Now, Democrats are not so shy, not as shy, anywhere close to shy as Republicans. They're saying, no, 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 no. What we need to do is enhance Social Security. What we need to do is expand Social Security benefits. And there's a bill going through Congress that is, that is likely, I think, to pass Congress. We'll see. That basically is saying, look, Social Security is going bankrupt by 2034 or by 2031, depending on the numbers you use. Social Security will basically be bankrupt. That's wrong. But more than that, Social Security is unfair. Social Security should be paying out more benefits to the people who most need it. Social Security should be used more to redistribute wealth. So the proposal, of course, is, is kind of a, a, a responsible proposal, right? So they, they, they want to spend more. But to do that, they realize they have to raise taxes. So they are, and we'll talk about raising taxes in a minute because there are many Democrats, and this is my, what, what might kill the Social Security bill, there are many Democrats who don't believe you have to raise taxes. There are many Democrats who believe, and, and many economists now, or some economists, who now believe you don't have to raise taxes because you can run deficits forever and you can basically print money with no downside to fund a lot of these pro programs, and we'll get to that. But, but their proposal here is basically to raise taxes, start off by raising taxes on the rich. So, raised, so if you know Social Security, you don't pay any t Social Security tax on anything you make over $132,900. So once you reach $132,900, you only pay Social Security taxes on that amount. On anything above that, you don't pay. They want to introduce so that if you make more than $400,000, you pay Social Security taxes on anything you make above $400,000, right? So they want the rich to pay. So one source, one source of revenue for all the various Democratic programs is soak the rich. Get the rich to pay for it all, right? Get the rich to pay for it all. And... Uh, so that's one source. Of course, they realize, the Democrats know this, uh, that there's a, a limit to that. There, there's only so much money that, the, that rich people actually have that you can take from them. And given the scope of the programs they want to engage in, that's not enough. But for Social Security, it's enough if they raise it. Plus, the idea is to raise from 6.2% to 7.4% all Social Security taxes so make them at 7.4% is misleading. It's actually 14.8% because you have to double it because the employee pays half and the employer pays half. So we're talking about 14.8% from 12.4%, uh, a 2.4% increase in taxes, uh, which is substantial and significant for everybody. That would be for everybody. But anybody earning more than 400000 and above would pay that on the 400000 and above, where today you don't pay taxes, Social Security taxes on anything over $132,900. So, 
And the idea is, uh, the idea is to expand benefits. The idea is to uh, just give everybody a 2% boost on benefits and then uh, make the cost of living adjustments uh, that the benefits, that the beneficiaries receive more, uh, more lucrative or more reflective of the true costs to, um, you know, to uh, old people who are retired. And then, um, you know, the idea is if they do all this, they spend more money, but they also take more money in. The idea is that this would extend the life of the program for another 75 years. So that is, that is program number one. And program number one is self-funding. Although, of course, one has to ask the question of what are the economic consequences? Of course, nobody asks these questions. What are the economic consequences of raising taxes by 2.4% on all Americans? And what are the economic ta uh, consequences of raising taxes on those making 400,000 or more by 14%? That is from zero right now to 14%. So nobody, nobody discusses that. Certainly nobody on the left discusses that. Um, taxes have, from their perspective, have no impact on behavior, have no impact on economic activity. Uh, you can raise taxes ad infinitum. Uh, you know, you can have top marginal rates of 80, 70, 80, 90 percent as they did in the 1950s and the economy continues to grow. So why worry? Be happy. The government can just print money whenever it needs to. So what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Right. So that is uh, that's proposal number one. Proposal number two is, of course, Medicare for all. I don't have the numbers with regard to Medicare fall and the consequence of Medicare fall, because, but they are astronomical. You're talking about a population of $350 million. You're talking about basically nationalizing the entire healthcare system. The consequence to this on cost are the minor effect. The real effect is the consequence on quality, the consequence on, uh, on, their bill, on access, the consequences on life expectancy, the consequence on quality of health. Uh, and, you know, and all on variety of, and of course, on future innovation, future innovation in healthcare would be decimated uh, and uh, future investment in, in drugs and in healthcare drugs would be decimated. The United States has 70, uh, provides 75% of all uh, innovation in healthcare today. If it was nationalized, if, if, if healthcare was socialized, it, which is what they, uh, which is what the Democrats want, which is Medicare for all, then uh, basically, you know, it would be a, 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 a catastrophe, a, a basically a catastrophe in healthcare. Um, the cost would be through the roof. Now, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez says, and again, think about this, think about it. It makes some sense, right? She says, but you don't have to pay health insurance anymore. The health insurance is not there, so you just walk into a doctor and you just get treated, right? So, you know, there is no, there is no issue here. Uh, so you get, you pay less social security, you pay a little bit more in taxes, and it all balances out. And indeed, if you look at the statistics on the percent of GDP spent by other countries on healthcare, the United States with its so semi-private system pays a lot more on healthcare. So if we could cut the amount of money spent on healthcare to European levels, then you would actually have a net savings. That is, the amount of money you spent in terms of insurance policies, you would save by the decrease. I mean, this is, again, what these democratic economists are saying. They don't care about quality because they say, look at Europe. Europe's quality is fine. They ignore the fact that the United States is where all the innovation, the experiments, the trials, the, the, the new stuff actually happens. That is ignored because that would require actual economic thinking, which economists today don't do. They just look at first level, shallow level, insignificant level consequences. They don't look at what actually is going on, what's interesting that's going on. For example, they don't look at the effect of their policy on innovation and on incentives. But Medicare for all would bust the bank and would require raising taxes. But of course, if you eliminate the need for insurance, then you take away a cost, a significant cost, which then can become insurance. Now, again, notice 
Both of these policies in Mo involve massive redistribution of wealth. Both of these policies involve a massive paternalistic state that knows what your saving needs are in Social Security, knows what your health care needs are, and in both involve massive amounts of central planning and control over their lives. Mo both involve massive steps towards great authoritarianism and, 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 and less freedom. But hey, who cares? We can pay for it. And look at Europe. It works for them. Why can't it work for us? So Europe has a much better pension system. The United States, it, it supposedly has a much better health care system. It's all supposedly, right? And because it's impossible to figure out how to measure those things exactly. And what are the Republicans going to say? Better health care, better pensions. Well, you believe in markets? That's so, that's so 20th century. We don't believe in markets in the 21st century. Yeah, 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 yeah. Markets are good for technology and stuff like that. But health care? No, you can't be serious. Nowhere in the world do we leave health care to markets. You know, pensions? No, people, people are too stupid. We've, we've seen all the evolutionary biology stuff, all the evolutionary psychology stuff, all the uh, behavioral economics, all the behavioral finance stuff, all the research shows that the fundamental characteristic of human beings is their stupidity. And therefore, we need the few who are smart, the few who are able, the few who can see beyond their meager, little, pathetic, consumerist, materialistic lives, we need them to manage us, to tell us what to do, to tell us how much to save, to tell us what medical procedures we can and cannot have, to tell us how much we can pay for them, and how much is too much, and you shouldn't pay for that, and to tell us what our lives are worth. We need the experts. We need to be ruled by experts, because our reason, our knowledge, our minds cannot and should not be trusted. This is called the revenge of the philosopher kings. Yeah, 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 yeah. You guys tried this neoliberalism, capitalist stuff. It doesn't work. We had a financial crisis. Right? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just, you know, I would be a better debate, debater than anybody on, on their side than anybody, than anybody I debate because, you know, the, the, a good debater on their side because he has no facts and he has no logic and he has no reality to go by, has to go by, and this is what the guy at Kent University did, they have to go by conventional wisdom. So 2008 was caused by capitalism, conventional wisdom. Um, Great Depression was caused by capitalism, conventional wisdom. Everybody knows that. Nobody's going to argue that. Um, all the problems that we have in the world today are caused by capitalism, conventional wisdom. Uh, you know, China, China has thrived and been successful because it's a managed economy conventional wisdom. Nobody argues against that. So you get over and over again these, these things that are, that are arguments. You guys are going to have to give me, um, you're going to have to give me a few, uh, a few minutes to finish this thing before I get to the Super Chat question. So I will get to them, but I, I guess we've only got one questioner, but I will get to them. Um, but uh, let, me, let me finish this trail because otherwise I'll lose your, uh, your Super Chat questions and I'll lose my train of thought. Now, all of those programs, Medicare for All, expansion of Social Security, are mild, moderate, middle of the road, cheap, easy, easy. Then the real big proposal that everybody on the left is truly excited about. And while they are going to quibble about the details, and there will be voices that want to moderate all, all the issues that are, that is, uh, that are being detailed, um, they love the framework. They love the big picture. They love the ambition. They love the grand scale of it. And they're not worried about paying for it. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, one second. So, what is that? Well, you should be able to guess what that is, right? It's the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal. 
The Green New Deal is this ambitious project to remake America. It's actually an ambitious project to remake the world. It is big, grandiose. It's a scary, hairy, grand vision for the world. Now, it's still short on details because Ocasio-Cortez put this up on the website and I guess withdrew it from the website and nobody's actually sure what exactly the, the New Deal is. But let's take just a few passages from the document she actually put up. Well, listen to this. We're going to move to hell with the UN, tell with the Paris Accord, tell with Obama's clean air, whatever. All of those were way too ambitious, way too, had no ambition. They talked about reducing, you know, uh, carbon emissions and reducing all that by, I don't know, 30% or 32% in 20 years or 15 years or 10. You know, that's pathetic. That is pathetic. The goal here is, the goal here is, should be, to be much more ambitious than that. And the Green New Deal, named after FDR's New Deal, also um, trying to get the zeitgeist of the Apollo project, of the mission to the, to, to the moon, is we're going to move America to 100% clean and renewable energy in 10 years. 10 years. 100%. No automobiles running on gasoline. No power plants fueled on natural gas or coal or anything um, or any fossil fuels. All, all renewable energy, and by here we mean renewable energy, we mean your windmills and we mean solar and we mean maybe hydro, but I don't really think hydro because hydro, you know, you have to build dams and stuff and that, that disturbs the, the, the ability of the, of, the, of the worms and the snails and the others. To actually, to actually do something. So they're gonna, every single power plant is gonna be solar and windmill. Now, just imagine what that looks like. I mean, how many of these you have to build? And where, right? And, and all the new power lines, because, I mean, you're gonna have to build these in places they don't exist right now, and the power lines don't exist. I mean, basically, you would have to carpet most of the desert in the southwest with solar panels. I mean, the number of windmills you would have to build is so great that pretty much every known species of large birds would be slaughtered and massacred and go extinct. Like all those eagles that we finally got back and, uh, you know, all those hawks, I mean, they're all dead. But basically the whole landscape would be windmills and solar panels. I mean, it, you know, we can ignore the energy that it took to build the solar panels and the windmills because, because, because we're thinking long term. We're, we're not going to pay attention to short term. We're thinking long term, right? Long term. These are wonderful things. So no, so everything. I mean, if you if you think about the magnitude of this, this is this is big, audacious. This is ambitious. Planet Earth is basically going to be coded in the warm areas by solar panels and in the windy areas, but, but pretty much all the windy areas by, by, I don't know where people are gonna live, I guess in between the windmills, they're gonna live. It, I mean, it's just, wow, talk about ambitious. Now, think about the amount of capital, the amount of money that is needed for something like this. This is on, on the scale of trillions of dollars. The infrastructure will have to be built, but this is great. We're going to completely rebuild the infrastructure. But she doesn't stop there. That's not enough. It's not enough to, to have clean and, you know, all these new power plants. We're going to retrofit, notice, retrofit, so make more energy efficient. Every building in America and upgrade and replace every, I emphasize, every building in the United States for state-of-the-art energy efficiency, every single building. I wonder if they count Puerto Rico. Hmm. I don't know if the, I guess the Democrats count Puerto Rico as part of the U.S. Every building. I mean, imagine. I mean, I guess 
this is why they want more immigrants from Mexico because who's going to build all this? I mean, this is, this is work on a scale that humanity has never seen before. This is bigger than World War II and the mobilization in World War II. This is bigger than FDR's New Deal by orders of magnitude. This is the biggest construction, renovation project in all of human history. This is bigger than the rebuilding of Europe after World War II. But that doesn't stop there, right? Because that's not enough. We're going to build out high-speed rail at a scale where air travel stops being necessary. Being necessary. Which means you're going to have to crisscross the entire United States to every small community, or at least to every medium-sized community in the U.S. Everywhere that has an airport will now have high-speed rail. I mean, just think of the magnitude of that project. I mean, and I always complain that Americans are not imaginative when it has, comes to you know, uh, 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 civil engineering projects. I mean, this would be huge. I don't know what's going to happen to all the snails, worms, lizards, rats that live along the path of the rail. Never mind what happens to the property rights of all the people whose land will have to be confiscated. But that's okay, because if we can build a wall and confiscate people's lands, let's build railroads. We did it once, we can do it again. Crisscrossing the United States. And within the cities, of course, because you have to get rid of cars. So it's not enough just to do... Now, by the way, I, I, I do find it interesting that uh, build that high-speed rail where air travel stops being necessary. Now, I'm a little worried about this one, I have to admit, because I live on an island, and I just think I'm going to be completely cut off. Now, I have to say that there is a certain appeal to being cut off from a world where Ocavio, Ocasio Cortez's vision becomes a reality. Yeah, I, I can't get to the US. Good. You know, the US is, by this point, is somewhere south of Venezuela. But so we're cut off, Hawaii's cut off. I guess you can't go to Europe. No, I mean, Europe, I mean, you don't need to go to Europe. How many of you need to go to Europe? You can, you can Skype with Europe. You know, if you want, you, you know, they'll do these virtual tours. You'll go in and you'll put on goggles and they'll take you to Sistine Chapel. You don't have to be there. You don't actually, actually have to tour Europe. That, what a waste of carbon fuel to fly you to Europe when we can simulate all of that. Right? So to hell with going to Europe. No more air, air travel, right? And then, of course, we need to create affordable public transits that, so that everybody can, doesn't have to drive. Now, we also are going to do this with a workforce that is paid. A living wage, a better than living wage, a wage that can really, they can, they can live really, really well on. Because after all, I mean, it'll only build with unions, and we have to make sure that the unions get paid well. And if you're not in a union, forget it, you're not going to be employed by this. And, and since we're going to need millions and millions and millions and millions of people to do all this work, we're going to have to bring in, I guess, immigrants. That's horrible for you Trump guys. You have to bring in immigrants to work on the project, to build all this stuff, and we're going to guarantee them this really, really high wage. I mean, everybody in the world's going to want to come because the American government is guaranteeing the high wage. So, I, I, you know, we'll see how this actually works out. Right? Um, oh, and by the way, by the way, the, the one important feature of the New Deal is, is the Green New Deal is that the one source of carbon-free energy that is efficient, effective potentially cheap, can be produced ad infinitum without any foreseeable limit, clean, safe, the safest form of energy available today. Fewer people have died from this source of energy than any other. That is nuclear. That must be completely shut down. So we will decommission every nuclear plant within 10 years. So there'll be net zero, zero, zero. Now, they don't guarantee zero emissions for a number of reasons. I think one is human beings breathe. And they're still not yet, we're still waiting, calling for the complete annihilation of the human race. Because we breathe out 
CO2. And then, of course, a big part of, of, of um, you know, uh, uh, greenhouse gases is methane. And the largest sources of methane is um, the farting of cows. So we're going to have to get rid of, the, of, of farting cows. And the only way to get rid of farting cows is to kill them. So they're going to massacre, you know, kill the millions and millions and millions of cows on the planet. And you're going to have to become a vegetarian, basically. And this is what... Ocasio-Cortez has, has, has been preaching. This is what uh, the left has been advocating for. Uh, this is completely consistent. This is completely consistent. Right? So we're not going to have enough food to feed people. We're certainly not going to have enough energy. So part of, I think, the solution here is to have millions of people, hundreds of millions of people potentially die. And, and that will reduce CO2 emissions. So the ultimate way in which this is being paid for, as Carl observes on Facebook, is through human sacrifice. Not even the sacrifice just of our dollars, we've talked about that, but just the sacrifice of our lives. We're just going to kill enough people and CO2 emissions go down and you have a great new deal. And actually, if you have fewer people, you don't have to build as many power plants. If you have fewer people, you don't have to build as many, as, you don't have to refit as many homes, as many buildings. Now, what happens when all this construction is over, right? Because then there'll be all these people who are unemployed. Well, don't worry, because they have a solution for that as well. Because part of the Green New Deal right, is a guarantee that everyone gets a job, a high-paying job, at least $15 an hour, probably more than that, a job. A job with a family-sustaining wage, family and medical leave, vacations and retirement security, and high-quality health care, of course, right? Medicare for all. Safe, affordable, adequate housing. So I guess the government will provide housing or at least give you a subsidy. Oh, we already do that. Maybe a bigger subsidy to buy a home. And this includes for people unwilling to work. So I guess that's the UBI, Universal Basic Income. So you don't want to work, that's fine. We'll give you enough so you can live a middle class life without working. Don't worry, be happy. I'm not sure who's going to build all the power plants if we're paying them not to work. But you know, those are details. Again, we can import people. But wait a minute, let me get this straight. If people come into the country and they're unwilling to work, do they get UBI? I guess they do, they're human beings. We can't discriminate. So we have this guaranteed job offer. Now you see why I think Democrats will be anti-immigration in the end. And all these people all over the world will come here and might as well make this, a you know, the United States, the global, not the government, that would be too assertive. That would be too self-interested. That would be too uh, making America central to the world. But we should become just the funders of the entire world. We should just be writing checks to the entire world. Check, right? And how is this paid for? All right, so, you know, I don't need to go through why this is nuts. I mean, this is basically a plan to kill human life, to destroy human life. So this is what... Ocasio-Cortez says, how is this going to pay for? Well, the same way we paid for the New Deal, FDR's New Deal, the same way that we paid for all the wars we've engaged in, including World War II, but also the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the same way we, we bailed out the banks, we'll pay for it the same way we did all that, which means what? And she's right. She's right. We, we've, we've done all these things. We're running right now, under Trump, we're running a trillion dollar deficit. Right? 800 billion, sorry. Soon to be a trillion dollar deficit. Economy's doing fine. Deficits don't matter. Deficits don't matter. All we need to do is print more money. I mean, I, what, 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 what about, why are, the, why are there constraints on this stuff? We'll just print more money. And 
They recognize that you can't tax it from billionaires, but indeed, they don't think taxes are that important. We just print more money. Now, if only was a, there was an economic theory that said, you can print money and as long as you spend it, this is the thinking, as long as you spend it on what are called productive endeavors, like building power plants and building cables and, and, and putting people to work, even if they're digging ditches. You can print as much money as you want with no negative economic consequences and actually the printing of money actually creates positive economic consequences. And as long as you're not printing mo this money and deploying it into an economy where there's already full employment and full deployment of all productive resources, and there's never full employment if you include immigration, there's never full deployment of economic resources if you include a global economy, then you can keep pouring money into the economy, you can keep printing money with no negative consequences and indeed plenty of positive consequences. Now what is this economic theory called? It is a relatively new economic theory. It is still relatively on the fringes, but it is becoming big. It is becoming major, substantial. There's more talking about it than anything else. It's called modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory, and, and the, the most well-known advocate for this theory right now, making the rounds, is Stephanie Kelton, a, an economist. She was the economist for Bernie Sanders' campaign last presidential election. And she is making the rounds, and she is challenging other economists to show how she is wrong. Now, I'm not going to get into the minutiae of this. Those of you interested, maybe I'll do a show just on this because it is kind of interesting because like most bad theories, really, really wrong theories, there's elements of truth to it that they then are exploited in order to, to, to articulate complete and utter falsehoods. But modern monetary theory is an entire economic theory that basically says that under the right circumstances, and the right circumstances, according to uh, uh, Kelton, it's almost always the right circumstances. And I think, she, well, she can't think. So, so to the extent that, you know, uh, when she doesn't, she doesn't actually appreciate everything that she's saying, uh, if you take it to the logical extent, there is no negative content, you just print money, you can do anything. You can do Medicare for all and use and print the money to take over the hospitals, build new hospitals, um, because it's a productive endeavor. So you're, you're basically increasing the money supply by the same amount as goods and services that are being produced because so the effect on inflation is zero. You can do the same thing supposedly with the electric grid and power plants and you can employ people as long as they're really employed. I think, I think monetary... Uh, modern monetary theory would, would not support a, UB, a UBI quite as much as support giving people very, very high wages for any job that they make. They would consider that a good thing. Um, so the government, this full employment act by the government where they would pay people to work if they couldn't find work, uh, they would be supportive of. And, and the whole theory says there are no negative consequences. The government has a free right here. It can go for it. It has, there's no problem. Now, there are massive issues with this, massive issues. There's a lack of appreciation of the effects of inflation. Just look at Zimbabwe, look at Venezuela, look at the United States in the 1970s. Although I'm sure Kelton has, an, has a, a counter to that, a, 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 a counterpoint to that. I haven't read it yet. I'm, I'm, still, trying to, I'm still trying to read up about this. To, uh, so I can give you a fuller uh, description and a fuller repudiation of this nonsense. Uh, so inflation, she would argue, is not a concern. And if there is inflation, what do you do in order to curb inflation? Well, inflation is caused by excess demand for a given number of goods. How do you reduce demand? You reduce demand by raising taxes. So taxes... Increasing taxes is a mechanism to defeat inflation. So you print money as much as you want, and then when inflation happens, 
you tax. Now, the big thing the theory completely ignores is incentives, the impact. Oh, well, well, put aside morality. Put aside morality. Put aside printing money in a thin air that is not connected to anything productive and, and the, the inevitable consequences of that and what it actually means. So put aside all that. But what they're ignoring from a purely economic perspective is incentives. They assume, like all of these kind of theories, that central planning is efficacious, that, that the government is good at printing money and allocating it appropriately so that it goes to effective, productive uses. They're very good at slamming the free market for not being efficient. But this is what the Repu Democrats are drawing on. They're drawing on an economic theory that basically says there's no effective limit to government spending. Government debt doesn't matter. Deficits matter zero. And, and they say, look at how big the deficit is today. Economy's doing fine. Look at how big the deficit is in Japan, 250% of GDP. Economy's doing fine. Nobody cares about deficits. They don't matter. Modern monetary theory tells us. So it's not even that they're big on raising taxes. The only reason to raise taxes for them, well, it's two reasons. One is to address the problem, the problem of inequality, right? To penalize the rich, in other words. And because the poor, you can just give them money. You just print money and give it to them. So you don't need to tax the rich for that. The only reason to tax is to penalize wealth creation. And of course, let's ignore the incentive. Let's ignore the behavioral consequences of that. And the other reason to tax is to reduce inflation, to take money out of circulation. Now, there are lots of economic issues here. How does this relate to what the Fed does? And, uh, you, you know, and there's, but there's also elements of truth here. We've seen that there are ways in which the government can print a lot of money with little uh, easily observable consequences. Now, that's the key, easily observable. One of the things that mo modern monetary theory has is a superficial, very thin layered, very thin understanding of economics. What they need to read is Economic in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, who describes in the, in the preface to it, economics is a science of the second, third, fourth level consequences, not just the superficial layer, which is all these people are focused on. So this is the, this is the new Keynesianism. This is the new justification for massive grabs of government power, uh, all in the guise of scientific economics. Uh, Stephanie Kelton is particularly evil. She, she has written that, you know, again, uh, um, not so much mirroring Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because I think Kelton is behind Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and I think she is the advisor, ultimately, to all these crazy political uh, projects. But uh, she had a tweet not so long ago about the fact that... Um, Billionaires are exploiters. Billionaires are thieves. Billionaires don't create wealth. They take it. They exploit it. They manipulate for it. So when you hear all the attacks on billionaires that are coming out the left, I had a series of articles here. Let me see if I can find them. I have a series. Just, I'll just read you the headlines of these, uh, of these articles. This, it just, this is Stephanie Kelton. This is, this is the whole atmosphere on the left right now, which I think a lot of people on the right share. This is why it's so dangerous. It's not fringe anymore. This is becoming, for the first time in American history, much more mainstream. Here it is. Um, should billionaires even exist? Should billionaires even exist? That was in the Huffington, Huffington Post. Um, where was the other one? Da -da 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 -da. Abolish billionaires. Abolish billionaires, an op-ed in the New York Times. And then there was a third one. I mean, a lot more than these, but these are three that I noticed. And I just pulled out, uh, but I can't find it. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You get the gist of it, but there's a, a whole series of these um, articles basically denouncing billionaires, denouncing the idea of billionaires, 
echoing what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has said about a society being immoral, a society that allows for the existence of billionaires is immoral. A society that allows for billionaires to become billionaires is immoral. She doesn't blame the billionaires. She blames us for making it possible for them to become billionaires. That has been echoed over and over and over again in, uh, in the media uh, to an excruciating uh, degree. Now, MMT is not yet, modern monetary theory is not yet that popular. Even Paul Krugman doesn't like MMT. So Paul Krugman is a critic of MMT, and he, he, continue, he uses his column to critique MMT, and there's a whole exchange between him and Stephanie Kelton that's going on in the various publications about a discussion of MMT and, and a critique uh, back and forth. But that leaves Krugman with some work to do, because Krugman has to provide a non-MMT, a non-just print money explanation for all these progressive democratic programs which he supports, which he's a huge supporter of, including the Green New Deal, although I don't think he'd support the Green New Deal in its wacky um, uh, frame, framework, because I think, I think what they'll do is they'll tone that down and come up with a much more, much more so-called reasonable document, something at least that's semi-doable. But he has to have a different framework to justify this. So he uses just straight neo-Keynesian economics to justify this. So he says, look, the three types of government expenditures that the Democratic Party is advocating for. Category one is investments, all right? Investments, investments in the future. Category two, right, is an expansion of existing public programs or subsidies, right? So an expansion of existing public programs, like Social Security, like the expansion of Social Security. And he would, he would consider Obamacare as part of that, that category. And the third category says is major system overhauls, major system overhauls, so complete changes. Um, completely socialized medicine would categorize under major uh, system overhaul, although he categorizes, um, he, he categorizes Medicare for all, where the government just pays for the health care, doesn't actually deliver the health care as just a, an expansion of an existing program. All right. So he says each one of these categories of programs should be funded in a different way, and this is where his Keynesian economics kind of theory and attitude comes across. So let's start with the investments. How do you fund investments? Well, investment, it's easy. Investments, he agrees with MMT. Investments, you just print the money, or a different way of thinking about printing the money, is you take on debt. You fund the investment with debt, and because the investment pays you back, and you use that back payment to pay for the debt. So it's easy, right? It's like a business would fund an investment, right? So he says if you can raise funds cheaply, and apply them to high return projects, you could go ahead and borrow. And federal borrowing costs are very low, less than 1% adjusted for inflation. And they are, they're very low. So you could do the Green New Deal because it's a high return project. You save the planet, that's very high return. And you can raise the money cheaply and it's not a problem, right? And even if interest rates rise a little bit, it's still cheap and it's still much cheaper than the benefit. And how, how do you pay off this debt? I mean, Krugman is a realist. He's not like, Sheldon, uh, not like Kelton, who believes you don't never have to pay off the debt. Well, you pay it off on the returns of the investment. And the returns of the investment are manifest in economic growth and in higher taxes, uh, you know, higher tax revenues in the future. She so says all of this is just investment. Now, notice, again, this assumption of a central planner. The government is good at making investments. The government is good at deciding what's a high return investment, what's a low return investment. It's very good at making these kind of decisions. One of the reasons I was hoping that TARP, you remember TARP, that was the government bailout of the banks? Well, it turns out that TARP was a profitable investment for the government. That is, the banks returned the money with interest to the government, and the government got more, much more than it expected to get back because far fewer banks actually failed than the hysteria at the time justified. So um, 
one of my worries about that, and I think it's, it's borne out, is that the government, is like economists like Krugman and the government would now think, oh, look, the government's pretty good at investing. It invested in all these banks and it got a great return. Now notice that invested in a bank, investment is kind of an interesting term, right? It forced the banks to take the money at the terms the government dictated. I don't call that investment. I call that, I don't know what you call that. I'm not sure what you call that. You know, that's what the mafia does, right? That's, yeah, that's what the mafia does. That's what organized crime does. No, no, you have to take my loan. You, you don't get to choose. You don't get to go to the bank. You take my money and here's the interest rate. And if you don't pay it back, I break your legs. That's what the government did. It's a mafia. And he wants the mafia, the government, the government acting in this way, to be expanded much greater. Both he and, uh, and uh, Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and everybody, one of the things they recognize is that private sector can't build all these things. They can't convert all this electricity to, to uh, renewables. They can't actually, there's not enough productive capacity. So the government is actually have to gonna buy the productive capacity. By the way, this is a straight route towards socialism, I mean, real socialism, not Denmark socialism, real Venezuela, Soviet Union type socialism. The government is not just gonna have to invest, it's gonna have to buy the means of production in order to get the production ramped up to the levels that they wanted to achieve with this you know, Green New Deal. So it's much worse than just the money raised. It's the takeover of whole industries, not to mention that they know nothing about the construction industry, the permitting business, the eminent domain, all of the things that go into actually building these things, they have no clue. But, but Krugman says, look, so for that, we just raised that, and that's okay, because the investments are good. Now, the second category, he says, this is the category where we expand the projects. He says, with the, these projects, now notice, too, how the Democrats are going to follow this party line. These expansion projects, now these are not very hard to fund, because what they entail is an increase in certain taxes, primarily on the rich. These are small enough so that we can tax the rich to pay for them. So for example, he says Obamacare is a good example of this. We, we, we raised certain taxes. We forced everybody to buy insurance to lower premiums, supposedly premiums went up. And it was self-sustaining, it was self-funding, he says, even though that's a lie. Like Elizabeth Warren's child care proposal, he says, is like one third of a percent of GDP. We can easily fund that. We just raise taxes on the rich and that's easily funded. Again, ignoring the consequences of raising taxes on the rich. Again, I'm putting aside the, the moral issues of taxing ever. Notice that every one of these proposals taxes the rich and taxes the rich. And I mean, they are, they are these milk cows. They're just cows to be milk for funding. They're the, the, the evil billionaires that happen to have a lot of money. So we just need to milk them for everything that we can. Think about how evil that is to treat human beings as sacrificial animals like that. We need to sacrifice the most able, the producers, the creators, the builders, the people with money. That's what we need to do in order to fund these programs. He says Medicare for, Medicare for All, as I explained earlier, is not that big of a deal. What you replace is private insurance with government insurance. Government insurance should actually be cheaper. So whatever you pay in to the government is actually going to be less than what you paid premiums to your insurance companies. That's not hard at all. And whatever gap we might ultimately have, we just tax the rich, right? So, you know, if he says, and in addition to that, look, this is where he's closer to MMT than he would like to admit. If interest rates are really low, yeah, we can even borrow money for this. In other words, we can print money even for this. No big deal. As long as the sums are small enough, then it's not a big deal to, to raise revenue through borrowing more money and to print money because the printing of money is not going to have a huge inflationary effect because it's small. You know, I'd like to know what small is for him. He never actually says. And he says, he says this, is, this, is a, this is quoting for Krugman, but the sums are small enough that the revenue involved could be raised by fairly narrow gorge taxes, in particular, Taxes that hit only high-income Americans. There's the sacrificial animal again. Let's sacrifice the rich, all of them. 
milk them until they don't have anything. And then what do you do? All right. The third category he says is more difficult because it's big. This would be like Medicare for all where you don't expect people to pay. It's where the government just provides everything for free. It owns the entire medical supply chain. A really major expansion of Social Security, not the little one that I talked about earlier, but major, would involve the same thing. Now, this would require a lot of revenue, he says. Now, he says that could come from things like payroll taxes. So now we can tax low-income and middle-class income people. Or, you know, there's a tax we haven't even considered yet, and that's a value-added tax. Now, he says these will hit the middle class. The middle class are sacred. The middle class are, are everything. You have to protect the middle class at all costs, according, supposedly according to the Democrats. But, you know, you know these, these proposals, they're... You know, they're important, they're big, they're, they're crucial, and, and they're beneficial. Ultimately, they pay off. So we have to, you know, so we'll tax the middle class, that's okay. But look, we might not be able to win on those because the middle class are the people who vote. So let's not highlight those, Paul Krugman says. He says, my main point now, however, is that when people ridicule progressive proposals as silly and unaffordable, in other words, Republicans, they're basically revealing their own biases and ignorance. They don't know economics. Investments can and should be debt financed. Benefits enhancement can be largely paid off with high-end taxes. Howard Schultz don't like it, but that's his, doesn't like it, but that's his problem because Howard Schultz has come out against all these crazy problems. Right? So Paul Krugman says, look, and this is what Kelton says, the science of economics is on our side. The science of economics says we can fund all these projects. You Republicans, all you're doing is revealing your fundamental ignorance of economics. And what are Republicans going to say? What are they going to say? Deficit financing is evil and bad and immoral and, and economically bad. Then how, how, come we're ha how come Trump is doing it and the economy, you say, is doing fantastic? You can't have your cake and eat it too. If deficit financing is bad, then what about Bush? What about Reagan? What about Trump? They all dramatically, under, in their administrations, increased the debt massively. Financed wars, financed expansion of the state, financed everything they wanted to do with more debt. You can't fight against that, Republicans. And where's your economic theory, Republicans? Oh, you mean you believe in laissez-faire capitalism? Really? Well, no, we don't. No, we're Republicans. We can't believe in laissez-faire capitalism. So what's your economic theory? Are you Keynesians? You're not, you're not free marketers, so what are you? We're mild Keynesians, we Republicans. We're mild. We, we're nice Keynesians. We, we, we just don't want to exaggerate. We, we like the state, but not too big. We, we want redistribution, but not too much. We like big projects like the Green New Deal, but, but not too big. Keep them under control. And you, you can see how Republicans can't defend against this, not Republicans, not more moderate Democrats. This is the winning strategy. The only thing they can defend against this is the American people. And the American people are at best confused. And at worst, they believe this stuff. They believe this BS. And Trump has only enhanced their belief in this BS. And Republicans have only enhanced their belief in the BS because they presented no alternatives. And they played right into this. So yesterday I talked about Mexico's turn towards socialism and how dangerous and how horrible that is, 120 million people on our southern border. But just watch what's going on in this country, what is going to happen. It doesn't matter if Trump wins in 2020 or doesn't win in 2020. This is the future. This is the future unless somebody can articulate a vision that is different, a vision that is better, a vision that is right. But who? Who on the Republican side? can do that. I don't see anybody, certainly not Trump. And if nobody can do that, then it doesn't matter who get, becomes president in the short run. In the long run, these ideas are the winning ideas. They now establish themselves in academia, in economics departments. They have the intellectuals. They have the intellectual support. They have the mass media. They have the media generally. They have most intellectuals, most writers, most thinkers. Who's going to stop them? Who's going to stop them? Republicans?
Somebody says, so what party can we join? Shouldn't, why do you need to join any party? I would never join a political party. You could vote for a particular political party, but don't join a political party. What the hell? Not until the political parties are far better than they are today. They're a mess. Joining them is sanctioning their horrific agenda, which is horrific on both ends, Democrats and Republicans. You don't have to be a Democrat or a Republican to be a human being, to be an American. On the contrary, the more American you are, the less you would want to join the Democrat or Republican Party. You can be an independent and vote whatever way you want. But I don't see the alternative to this. I mean, they're good free market economists. They're good people out there, but nobody's listening to them. They have no power. They have no power, into, it seems like, no power intellectually. And I mean, they're powerful intellectuals, but they have no power on the culture. And they certainly have no power on the politics. You've got all these think tanks writing all these papers about free markets, Cato, American Enterprise Institute, heritage sometimes. And what impact is it having? Where is the counterproposal to the Green New Deal? What would be a counterproposal? Right? Deregulate on a massive scale. Free up the economy on a massive scale. Stop all government subsidies, all of them, to everybody. Farmers, solar panels, everything. Where's that proposal? Might be, I mean, I'm sure there are white papers, plenty of white papers. But give me a politician who has the balls to talk about it. Not one. Not one. What's the counter proposal to Social Security expansion? The elimination of Social Security? How about privatizing Social Security? What's the counter proposal to Medicare for all? Privatize Medicare by voucherizing it and then slowly eliminating it. What's the counter proposal to Obamacare? Oh, no, we can't even repeal that, Republicans. They can't even repeal that. But the counter proposal would be real free market health care. Where's that? Where's the proposal? I'm sure, again, there's a white paper. I know there are white papers. But where's the politician who stands up and advocates for it, really advocates for it, with passion, commits himself to it, runs on it? None. None. Just in a mesh, maybe. You know, I become, a, I become a fan of Justin Amash's, even though I'm sure there are issues on which we fundamentally disagree. But you got to give the guy credit for the courage that he has in going after Trump's bad policies, going after his own political party when they engage in bad policies. He's just, he's, he's the only principled congressman I know of. Uh, much better than Rand Paul, much better than a lot of the other guys. Uh, Amash is, is really the guy to follow. You can follow him on Twitter. I often retweet his tweets. So I don't agree with him, I'm sure, on foreign policy and some other things, but he's so good on, on standing up to Trump right now. He's so good on standing up to the Republican Party right now that, that I give him kudos for all of that. <sighs> all right. Um, we have... Uh, we're going to take Super Chat. I, I, I fear that there's a bunch of Super Chats, so we might be here for a while. But, but let's, let's go down the list. I've, I've not followed the chat for a while because I've had to... The chat... See, if the chat keeps rolling, then at some point I can't access the first Super Chat questions. That's why it's not good to ask me Super Chat questions early in the session that are unrelated to the topic I'm talking about because then they disappear. And I either have to write them down or I need to just freeze the screen so it doesn't scroll. So, uh, all right. What's your opinion on Trump's executive order for free speech on college campuses? One, there is no such executive order yet. And I'll believe it when I see it, and we'll see what it actually is, who it covers, how it, how it analyzes it. But generally, I'm opposed to it. Generally, I'm opposed to it. The government's job is to not to tell universities, which are still semi, or in many cases, semi-private property, but even the state universe should be treated as if they're to some extent private property. And to tell them which speaker they can and which they can. How do you implement a free speech for campus thing? You have equal time for Republicans and conservatives. What about libertarians? What about uh, the Green Party? What about animal rights people? What about objectivists? What about Nazis? I mean, how do you, how do you allocate the time? How do you determine that? The job of the government is that when there are riots, when there's violence, 
that prevents somebody from speaking, the government must protect that person's ability to speak, assuming it's on private property or that it's in. So when Ben Shapiro was invited to Berkeley, couldn't speak because of violence, that's where the government needs to enter, needs to make sure Ben's... But the fact that Ben Shapiro is disinvited from a university, it, that is the right of the university. Now that's bad and wrong, but it is the right of the university. And of course, this... F now, I know the universities get a lot of money from the government. The universities are quasi-government institutions. All of that is true. But the solution to that is to eliminate the funding to the universities, not to use the fact of the funding to now amass layer upon layer upon layer of demands on the university to fit some political agenda. Now, I know the left has done this already with Title IX and, and a lot of other things where they've used government funding in order to try to cram down employment laws and anti-discrimination stuff and all things like that. But that's bad. That is bad that the left has done that. And it's wrong for the right to do the same thing, even if I agree more with the rights agenda, if I agreed more. So no, I do not think the funding of universities should be an excuse for the government to then go in and tell the universities how to run themselves. The solution is to eliminate the funding. It's just the same as, I don't believe the cronyism by, let's say there is cronyism by Facebook and Amazon and Google and so on, is a justification of the government to then tell them how to run their business. The solution to cronyism is to stop it. It's to stop the corruption, to stop subsidies, to stop the, the, the relationship with government and business, not to use the cronyism to expand government power. I mean, imagine now the government becomes the arbiter of who can speak and who can't speak on American campuses. Well, but this is where we want to head with regulating Facebook and regulating Google and regulating YouTube and all these things regulating what they can and cannot say and how the search results should be. Who, who will decide that? Who will decide that? A bunch of bureaucrats? A collection of bureaucrats? How do you do that? And whereas you could somehow make the argument, it's a wrong argument, it's an evil argument, that there is monopoly power of the, on, on the internet. There's no monopoly power in universities. There are thousands of universities in the United States. If I can't speak in one, I can probably speak in another. Again, the government should stop funding universities. The government should stop student loans. The government should stop student aid. The government should get out of all businesses related to regulating, controlling, and funding the universities. There, this experiment has been a massive, unmitigated disaster, and it should end. The solution is not now to regulate from the right. Your opinion on Ihan Omar's anti-Semitic remarks. I mean, Ihan Oman is a horrific person. Uh, she is, uh, you know, again, she wears that, uh, you know, she, 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 she holds a, a, a barbaric, from everything I've seen, she's a real Islamist. She holds a barbaric Islamist ideology. On top of that, you know, she expresses herself clearly in anti-Semitic with anti-Semitic remarks, suddenly, if it's not anti-Semitic, they are blindly, viciously anti-Israeli, which means blindly, viciously anti-civilization, anti-Western civilization. So she is viciously anti-civilized, a civilized country and should be condemned by all means for that. So even if you don't, even if she says, oh, I'm not anti-Semitic, I'm just anti-Israel. Okay, I'll take that. That is vicious in and of itself. So uh, I, I, I think it's horrible. I think it's horrible she was elected. Uh, I think the Democrats need, if, if, you know, unless this is the direction they want the party to get, somebody should run against her in the primaries and defeat her because uh, this is, you know, this on top of socialism, the end of this country. Okay, Drudge. Uh, Action Jackson asks, Drudge report, the House Judiciary Committee will begin investigating into pos possible obstruction of justice and abuse of power President Donald Trump. Do you think they have a case, or is this just more shenanigans? Yeah, I mean, I think everything has a case. I think, I, you know, I don't view uh, all these investigations as completely bogus any more than the investigation of Republicans did on Obama, which were endless, or the, or the sex scandal impeachment of Bill Clinton in, in, you know, by Republicans back then. 
I mean, these are all, I think, overall relatively trivial issues as compared to the evil ideology people like Trump and Clinton and Obama held. And I wish the attacks were ideological. I wish the attacks were about content and substance and the, the, the essence of the presidency and the, role, the, the, the meaning of the role of government. But yeah, I mean, why wouldn't they go after him? He is he's open to that. He, ref, he refused to reduce his taxes. Uh, he, he's got all these relationships with the Russians, which he did not disclose, that hotel that he was going to build while the campaign was going on. There's, there's all kind of shenanigans going on in the, in the background. He, he talks and acts like a, a, a mafia boss. He, you know, so, you know, I, you know, why wouldn't they? Politically, it, it's a no-brainer for them to do this. And so is it shenanigans or do they have a case? I think both. It's shenanigans because this isn't the core of the problem with Trump and this isn't the core of what we should be going after. But has he opened himself up to these kind of things? Absolutely. And, you know, he has a lawyer like, like, like this Cohen guy who's clearly a scumbag. I mean, if you hire a scumbag as a lawyer, what does that say about you? Something important, I think. Um, if you hire a lawyer that talks and acts like he's a lawyer of a mafiosa, what does that say about you? Something important, I think. So, yeah, I mean, Donald Trump has opened himself to that. It doesn't surprise me and it doesn't horrify me in particular. This is the kind of things happen in a two-party political system where one party's in power and one party's out of power. They go after each other and as soon as the one party gets a bit of power, they use it to go after the president. Again, Republicans did this with Clinton. They were just looking for an excuse to go after him. And they were looking for stuff to do with Obama. They just could never find the issue. I mean, remember, this, this is a president who during the Obama years was hounding the president about the fact that he wasn't born in the U.S. He was a birther. He's a conspiracy theory birther. That's who you elected president of the United States. So why wouldn't the Democrats go after him? Why wouldn't they invent conspiracy theories? Why wouldn't they pursue the Russia affair? I mean, this is a president who has openly supported conspiracy theories. So, you know, you, you play that game, you're going to suffer from that game. Absolutely. So why anybody surprised, why anybody shocked, why anybody's offended by it is shocking to me. I mean, this is exactly what you'd expect from a president like this. Okay, do you think intersectionality is similar to the butterfly effect theory? The butterfly effect theory, I guess, is the theory that says that a butterfly flaps its wings in China and it has an impact on something, on everything, not on something, on everything. And there's a sense in which, in physics, that's true, but there's a sense in which infinitesimal effects don't matter, and you have to hold context, and in the context, they don't matter, so the butterfly effect doesn't really matter. Right? It, it has no consequences. Um, no, I don't see the connection with intersectionality. Intersectionality is about the hierarchy of oppression. So it's the idea that if you are, if you are, for example, if you are homophobic, then by definition you must be a racist and you must be anti-women and you must be da 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 da. So all these are connected. They're all related. They're all the same, and. It, if you're an oppressor, you're an oppressor by definition, and you're just oppressing everybody. And then it creates a hierarchy of oppression. So women are oppressed because they're not men, and men are oppressors because they oppress women. But men can be white, black, Latino, and that would change their relative how much they oppress, right? And then women can be lesbian, or, or you can also be gay and a man. And that will change how oppressed you are or how oppressing you are. So all these things are kind of interconnected and hierarchically related. And at the end of the day, it's just a form of, uh, I've talked about this, I've done whole shows on intersectionality. It's, it's, it's really a form of altruism taken to its ultimate consequences. That is the virtue of need. And then it's a question of we all, f because we all want to be virtuous, this is also related to the, that guy who pretended to be attacked, right? We all now need to be needy, right? Because that's what gives us virtue and that's what gives us other people's moral attitude, you know, moral respect. So there's a competition to the bottom. So the, the, the best, 
according to intersectionality, the most oppressed and therefore the most virtuous are trans, I guess, black, trans, whatever, 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 right? So, you, you know, you, you have to be oppressed in every dimension of your life. All based on superficial characteristics like skin color, sexual orientation, and things like that, right? Or gender. And, and I'm sure now that we have 98 genders, there's a hierarchy of which one of those 98 is more oppressed than the others. So you, you, that's intersectionality. I don't think that's related to the butterfly effect. The, I don't think it's related to everything is related. The, 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 the idea that something that happens far, far away causes or has an impact on everything, a causal relation with everything else. All right, I think I lost one of these Super Chat questions as I was browsing down. As I said, they don't work. So if I don't answer your question, either ask again with a low amount or ask another time. Okay. Is there anything about European culture you like better than American culture? <laughs> yeah, Europe has a culture. <laughs> I mean... America doesn't really have a culture. This is not my point. This is Ayn Rand's point. Ayn Rand argued that America had no culture. That, that it, 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 was a, it was Europe had the culture. The great achievements, the great cultural achievements, particularly in art, are European. They're not American. I mean, what great art is there that's a product of America other than Ayn Rand? And she was born in Europe. Um, even many of the great scientists who came who, who, American who were born in Europe, even many of the entrepreneurs were immigrants. Um, so Rand culture is is a set of achievements. Well, in the realm of art, certainly there are very few achievements that America has achieved, and to the extent that Americans have achieved certain things, they've achieved it based on ideas based on techniques, based on studying in Europe. So Europe is the fountainhead. Europe is the source of all American cultural achievements. Um, also of all destruction, but, but put that aside. So uh, Europeans justifiably are, you know, as a, as a broad statement, are, have, have a better appreciation for the arts, have a better appreciation for um, for museums, uh, have a better appreciation for the great art of the past, a great appreciation for, at least the European culture has been in the past, I don't know if it is today, um, a great appreciation for, for, for literature, great literature, for great classical music, for opera, for things like that. America's great cultural achievement is probably jazz, right, for, in the arts. And, and jazz is good, jazz is beautiful, but jazz is no Beethoven or Rachmaninoff. Um, no great real American painters, sculptors. Um, I mean, that's all in Europe. That's all in Europe. Popular music, popular art is, is, is very strong in America. Movies. Um, but, yeah. So I think that's a tricky one. Now, the one thing about American culture, the one achievement of American culture is in a sense it's sense of life. It's positivism. It's Gung Ho, and the greatest achievement in American culture is business, is the business achievement, the technology, the love of technology. Those are the things that I think characterize American culture, which I love so much, right? But in terms of achievements, all the achievements that American culture has provided us and that are originally American are in the realm of business, uh, not in the realm of what you would typically call culture. But uh, business is part of American culture, so I think maybe business counts. So I'm... I'm I'm kind of equivocating here about what culture means. I'm kind of rambling. Um, but I, I remember Ayn Rand's statement, and it's in the, I think it's in the Romantic Manifesto, that basically America has no culture. And I think to a large extent that's true. The better aspects of American culture imported from Europe, the part of American culture that's original to America, is the only part is really business. And I love that. So I love the European love of the arts, the European love of beauty. The focus in Europe, in the past at least, on beauty, on beauty. Um, all right, 
Marius asks, what is your opinion of Norway and its current government? We have a system where children have free health care and school. Can welfare for kids be good? No, I mean, I'm, I'm against the whole system in Norway. I, I actually have a talk that you can find on my YouTube channel. Just look under Scandinavian welfare state. I have a talk that I gave in Bergen in Norway on the evils of the Scandinavian welfare state. And I talked a lot about Norway. I, I think Norwegian culture ultimately is in decline. Um, the, the productivity is in decline. Um, you know, life is in, in some senses too easy in Norway because of the oil. Um, so it can afford to do stupid things and not really pay the consequences. But look, Norway has a mixed economy that that is maybe more redistributive uh, than Sweden and Denmark because of the oil. I think that would be true. But is is relatively unre less regulations than most. So it, it, it's capitalist in, in many essential characteristics. But I think the free health care, the schooling is bad. I think it's low quality. Uh, again, maybe it's better than the U.S., but that's not exactly a good standard. I, I, I think it's, it's immoral to provide free health care or government health care and government schooling. I, I think you need competition in both realms and you need a real industry. You need innovation. You need entrepreneurs. You need builders and creators and makers. And, um, yeah, all right. So uh, look, at, look at my talk on the, Nor on the uh, welfare state. And I can do more. I can look more specifically at Norway and look at what's happening there. But I think in Norwegians, I think many, I think the most hardworking Norwegians, the Norwegians that are most entrepreneurial, if, they, if it was easy for them to immigrate to the United States, I think many of them would. And I think that's true of Sweden, and I think that's true of Denmark. The problem is the United States doesn't want you. It makes it very, very hard for people, hardworking people, uh, innovative people, entrepreneurial people, to come to the United States. So it's easier just to stay in a place like Norway that is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. Uh, didn't Trump cripple Obamacare and get rid of net neutrality? Yeah, Trump crippled Obamacare, but crippled Obamacare in a stupid, self-defeating way. He hasn't fixed anything. You have to fix the insurance market in the United States. And as long as you don't fix the insurance market in the United States, crippling Obamacare does nothing. It actually reduces the quality of health care. So to cripple Obamacare, with, cripple Obamacare without getting rid of it, A, and without offering an alternative, B, is worse than doing nothing. Yes, it's worse than doing nothing because it, it's actually going to accelerate the total bankruptcy of the insurance, the health insurance market, which is going to lead to single payer health care, which I think Trump will ultimately support. So uh, by crippling Obamacare, you've made the insurance companies even more susceptible to failure. And you've made the quality of what they provide in terms of insurance policies to their subscribers even worse than under Obamacare. So Obamacare was going to fail, but it was going to fail slowly. Crippling Obamacare will make Obamacare fail fast. When Obamacare fails, the only solution acceptable to the American people will be single-payer health care. Did, did Trump get rid of net neutrality? Yes, he did. One of the few things that, no, not one of the few things. A lot of the agencies under Trump, a lot of the regulatory agencies under Trump have done good work in getting rid of regulations. One of them was net neutrality. So that's a, definitely a plus. So I, I've applauded from the beginning. I've applauded the good people that Trump has sometimes placed at the head of the regulatory agencies and the work that they have done. I think to really do deregulation properly and in a lasting fashion, you would have to, um, you, you know, you would have to have legislation. And that is something that the Republican House and Senate and this administration have not pursued. They have pursued doing it uh, they pursued doing it just, uh, you know, through the regulatory agencies, and that can be reversed immediately when the Democrats come into power. Uh, all right, Anthony, Anthony, don't ask me questions like that. I won't answer them. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want questions where you ask me, what do I think of this and this? objectivist or objectivist friendly intellectual don't ask me those things 
I'm not interested in the answers. You make up your own mind about what you think about these people. Um, some of them are good, some of them are not so good, some of them are great, some of them are not so great. Uh, there's a whole variety. Some of them are mediocre, some of them are... But you have to make those judgments. I'm not going to stand here and rank people affiliated with objectivism. If you want to ask me about uh, intellectuals outside of objectivism, I'm happy to do that. But I will not comment on, on people like that. Plus, particularly people that I have a history with, particularly people who've attacked me publicly, why would I comment publicly unless I was going to rip them to shreds? And I don't want to do that. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. Is a legislature considered necessary to a capitalist political structure? Yes, absolutely. So uh, an objectivist capitalist political structure would actually have a legislature. I think a legislature basically very similar to that of the United States. You, you would want two houses so they could veto each other. Uh, generally, you want to... You, you want to be able to create as much consensus as possible. Leg but you do need legislation. For example, you need legislation when uh, new application of property rights come about, like the internet. You need to think about how property rights apply in this new space and how intellectual property applies in this particular realm. You know, you need the legislature to be able to pass laws to, to define property rights on the moon when we have the technology to go to the moon and settle the moon. You have to be able to define... Uh, to define the law and you have to be able to ban certain things and 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 you know once the science is there let's say ban certain chemicals from being spewed into the air when the science is unequivocal about the human harm that they create um, so yes laws are important and, and crimes change all the time so it's not a static now i don't think you need a full-time legislature indeed in the 19th century the legislature in the united states didn't meet that often the legislatures had jobs that they actually had, and they worked most of the year, and they would come and vote and, and go away. So, yes, you definitely need a body that passes laws, and then you need an executive branch that executes on those laws, and you need a legislative branch, branch that, among other things, um, makes sure the laws are consistent with the Constitution. Who's going to win 2020 Trump or Bernie? I don't think Bernie's going to win the Democratic nomination, so I don't think it's going to be Trump or Bernie. And I don't make political predictions. I don't know who's going to win. I think it could be very much a toss-up. Um, but I, I really don't know. I think, I think the Democrats, if the Democrats run a, a, a more moderate Democrat, a, a, but, but are not like a corrupt, hateful, stupid Democrat like Hillary, but a, but a moderate Democrat with moderate views... Uh, not a not a Bernie or a Elizabeth Warren, but somebody, you know, I don't know who that would be. Maybe it's Kamala Harris. Um, maybe maybe it's uh, Beto, but Beto moved way to the left when he ran in Texas. But you know, Beto gave Beto gave uh, Beto Rock gave um, a cruise a run for the money in in Texas of all places. So Beto could probably do pretty well on a national scale. Um, maybe you know. So I think if, if the Democrats ran somebody like that, I think they would have a re and somebody with a thick skin who can handle the the the, the kind of uh, childish, stupid, um, uh, personal attacks that Trump is going to lever at them. If they can handle themselves with class in the face of that, which, for example, a lot of the Republicans couldn't, um, but fiery enough to fire back at Trump, to, to stand up to Trump, to challenge Trump, to push Trump, to, to show that they're not going to be pushed around by Trump, then I think the Democrats could win quite easily, I think. I don't think Trump has a solid foundation, um, particularly if the Democrat, you know, could, you know, could get the minority vote out, you know, could get, could get minorities in places like Michigan and Phil in Pennsylvania to vote. Although, you know, it's, it's, um, it's hard to tell whether they'll be able to do that if the economy is doing well. If the economy is doing well, it might be very difficult to defeat Trump uh, in spite of how he is. And, and it basically will do boil down to who the Democrats put up, how excited he can get the base, and at the same time not alienate everybody else. Not alienate everybody else. Um, Yeah, you see, I mean, even in my chat, I've got people who hate billionaires, right? So, and, and this, is, this is the thing that's happened, is that it's a right and left issue, and that, to me, 
is um, y- you know is a complete complete repudiation of America and Americanism and uh, the right and the left now are both basically anti-American statists and are going to lead us towards some form of massive growth of government and massive uh, government involvement in in our world. So um, it scares me. It really, really, really scares me where this country is heading. And, and I don't see the positives. I don't see the, the positive signs in terms of heading in a different direction. Um, Jason asks, this will be the last question. What do you mean if the economy is doing well, it will be difficult to defeat Trump? You always say people don't vote their pocketbook. I, yeah, that's right. But at the margin, there are people who won't come out and, and vote against Trump if they've got a job. So at the margin, there are people who are impacted by the pocketbook. I don't think the long-term trends are determined by the pocketbook. But I think the short-term, sometimes, so for example, if if blacks in Philadelphia and blacks in Detroit and places like that who did not come out for Hil- for Hillary Clinton and I think caused, you know, she lost those two states because of the urban votes in those places. If, if, if they had come out at a similar pace that they came out for Obama, uh, Trump wouldn't have won those two states. So there is a certain percentage of the population that is going to vote based on how comfortable they feel. I don't think that determines the long term, the long term. And I think I think the more intellectual people are, the less likely they are to vote their pocketbook. This is why I don't think pocketbook issues affect the wealthy, the relatively educated, the relatively educated constantly, constantly, constantly. Uh, the educated, um, the, the educated vote to the left and against their economic, um, their economic incentives. I'm not sure that will happen the same uh, with the less educated people who now have a job and don't want to rock the boat. But but it's going to be interesting to see. I think on the other hand, this is why I said it's important to get out the base and and, and excite the base. If they can excite the base, if they can give the base enough socialism, enough hint that they would go in that direction, then I think you get a lot of young people voting, young people who did not vote for Hillary. Young people stayed home for Hillary. Young people voting, and that could shift the election against Trump. But the other point is that people vote morality, but, but what is the big difference between, I mean, I know you guys, some of you will freak out. What's the big difference between Trump and the left on some of the moral issues? Moral issues in terms of big political moral issues. I mean, what's the difference? They both want to want statism. They both want more government control. They both want more government power over our lives. A lot of people are going to say, yeah, life's pretty good. I'm not going to choose. And that'll help Trump. Turnout, low turnout will help Trump. All right. Ooh, one last one. Please be sure to tip your hardworking host. Yes, please be sure to tip me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, probably do another show tomorrow, tomorrow night. So probably 7 or 8 p.m. East Coast time. And of course, I, I uh, really respect your contributions and your support. Please go to my website, youronbookshow.com slash support. A lot of you who uh, left Patreon have not yet joined, rejoined. So there are about 100 of you that are missing, missing in action. So I'd very much appreciate if uh, those of you who listen to the show, those of you who enjoy the show, th- those of you who think you benefit from the show, if you show your support for the show by going to your own book show, dot com slash support or if you don't like doing it right there with paypal you can go to subscribe star subscribe star.com slash your own book show subscribe star.com slash your own book show either one of those uh, yeah i thought it was a pretty good show we covered a uh, pretty an hour on one topic pretty thoroughly so uh good and i will see you all tomorrow and then of course i'm off on tuesday nine city tour nine events Uh, Maybe I'll bump into some of you at some of my talks. Uh, You can find my schedule, by the way, at youronbookshow.com as well, if you're interested to see if if I'm going to be speaking in your area. 
See you guys. Bye.